Okay, welcome to the Wildlife in a Galaxy Far, Far Away panel here at Force Fest. Um, real quick, Force Fest is raising money for Make-A-Wish, so you can donate via the link in the chat, or if you're on Get Vocal here, there's a blue diamond up in the top of your screen, and uh, Get Vocal will match 33% of donations made there. So, all right, we're gonna start right away. I am uh, Melissa Miller. I'm a scientist and science writer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan, child of the 80s. Uh, there we go, figure this out. Child of the 80s, um, don't actually remember the first time I saw the movies, I was so young, um, and just been really excited about them my whole life. Uh, I've done some articles for Star Wars Insider uh, about the natural history of animals in the Star Wars universe. Um, so I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves and talk about their connection to Star Wars and also a memorable critter uh, for them from the Star Wars universe. Mine is Porgs. Um, that's the one that really got me most interested in connecting Star Wars to my science background. And that's one of the articles I've written for Star Wars Insider was, um, you know, if Porgs are nesting on the ground like they're shown in the movie, what does that say about them? It shows there's not natural predators to be worried about or that they're really aggressive and that's why they have those teeth. So little things like that really got me into it. So, um, all right, let's start with Frank. All right, my name is Frank Santana and I'm a herpetologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And I've always been interested in the little creatures from Star Wars. I remember when I was a kid, um, rewinding the scene from Return of the Jedi when that creature um, outside of Jabba's palace snags a little small mammal or something and what it looks like. Um, so we'd watch it and ask my dad to rewind it over and over again. And I later found out that it's called a wart and um, just kind of that it has characteristics just like a real life amphibian and I study amphibians so it's it's my big connection and I just love all the creative and cool creatures that are often inspired by real life creatures here on earth so happy to be here great thanks Angela hey everybody uh yeah so I'm Angela Zomplis I'm a PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, I primarily study polar science and with a particular interest in astrobiology and the potential for life in space. Um, so to do that, we kind of look at extremophiles, which are organisms that live in extreme conditions. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that in Star Wars, uh, ice planets. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Roth. Um, my favorite creature is the Tauntaun. Um, and those guys rely off of ice algae, which I study now. Um, so cool connection. I was also in uh, Melissa's uh, Star Wars Insider magazine article um, talking about, again, uh, you know, kind of cool relationships between what we see on Earth in extreme environments and, and what we see in Star Wars universe. It's very cool. Yeah, so that is coming out in the next issue of Star Wars Insider, but it's been delayed. So any day now, hopefully. Um, okay, let's get Carol and, <laughs> you need Carol and Jake to hop into spots too. Sorry, Angela. Um, okay, and Tracy. I'm an ecologist. I've been working in the fields of uh, mostly uh, restoration ecology and vegetation management. Um, and my, uh, my specialty is plant ecology. Um, I've been a Star Wars fan since I was eight years old in 1977. And I've just always appreciated the, the, little, the little critters in the backgrounds and the peripheries of the scenes in Star Wars. It just adds so much richness an interest to that universe and uh I'll say the the creature that intrigues me the most is the zillow beast because i'm kind of fascinated by animals that seem to have some connection to the force and zillow beast obviously can sense the dark side of the force given his fascination with uh palpatine right okay so tracy you're welcome to stay on screen here um uh terrell can you introduce yourself Oh, well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Carol Whitlatch, and I was the principal creature designer for Star Wars The Path of Menace, also for the remastered versions of um, the original trilogy. And um, let's see, I've worked also with Disney Imagineering for doing creature work for the, the theme parks and uh, other Lucasfilm projects as, as well. And I guess my my favorite creature is the Sando Aqua Monster because she is like absolutely huge. <laughs> She's the biggest creature I ever designed and I, I enjoyed I enjoyed her a lot. So. Great. And Jake. 
Last but not least. Uh, I, I'm uh, Jake and Davis, and I have uh, been working on all the new sequels and spin offs as a creature and story designer for the CFX, Creature Effects Department. Uh, I designed BD8, uh, Korg, and Dio, uh, among many other things. Uh, as far as Star Wars goes, and uh, um, inspirational uh, creatures, I loved, I think, as a kid. The Thorntorn, like Angela, the Thorntorn to me was, uh, was fantastic because it was so, so believable. You know, you've got this combination of like a, a, a kangaroo and a, and a sheep or a ram, and combined with that, when then they kind of slice it open with the, the lightsaber and the guts go out. I mean, you know, as a little kid, that was just so cool and so disgusting, and you know, it's just, it was so believable. It added this extra layer of reality, it's got the in, in it killing out and uh, saving Luke's life. There we are. Yeah, nice, great. So my first question is gonna be for our uh, concept artists uh, about uh, what Tracy, I believe mentioned in terms of having those wildlife uh, and those creatures sort of fill out the universe, even if they're not you know, essential to the plot. So can you talk a little bit about uh, Terrell um, working with George Lucas and what that meant um, for him and then Jake uh, you can add how JJ and Ryan, you know, sort of continued that tradition. Well, um, working with George Lucas, the, the objective was to make all the worlds of Star Wars seem to be a place that we could all go to and visit. And so on an intuitive level, they had to be relate to what we experience here on planet Earth. And on planet Earth, we have many different types of ecosystems and many, many, many hundreds of thousands of niches for biological creatures within those ecosystems. And so the world of Star Wars had to um, reflect that. The galaxy of Star Wars had to reflect that. Reflect that. So we have obviously just like, you know, there's like celebrity creatures like Bonthas or OPC cuddlers or whatever, but then you have a lot of other creatures that are there in the periphery but that, that are just as present. And so we went over the top to create many, many, many um, ancillary creatures so that it would feel like a, a living and lush world to, to be in. Great. Yeah, I, I realize I'm gonna present here. I have some of the concept art, Terrell, that uh, you sent me and some from Jake as well that uh, I'll try to pull up when it's relevant. So you can really see from these Phantom Menace ones um, you know, just how, how lived in these universes are, even when it's just, you know, uh, pigeons up on the roof equivalent yeah. here. <laughs> so. so, Jake, how did that continue into the sequels? Uh, yeah, similarly, there was always this sort of like, I think from every director, whether we succeeded to do it or not, certainly they, they you know, they would, they wanted to sort of have this, uh, little cutaways, they call it throwaway moments where you cut away to some little bit of wildlife. Just to sort of add, I think it's just that layer of believability and reality to that planet, and you're not, you know, for a split second, you're not focusing on, on the, uh, the the heroes, and you're just sort of going into into something that represents the planet. And yeah, we did that with the steel pecking bird when Ray is on her way back to Nima Outpost. And you see this sort of momentary flash of this bird here, just pecking away at some metal. It eats metal. It somehow um, adapted to uh, the, the, the you know, survive on the wreckage that um, and the ore and the minerals that it can find, and even the porgs with Ryan, you know, they were there. I think I've said this before, and people might know this that you know, they exist purely because of the uh, the location. Skelly Michael was a a, uh, a a world. I can't remember what it is now. It's, it's the protector. They protect all the puffins there. So they can't really get rid of all the puffins and a lot of puffins flying around and, and Ryan wanted to sort of uh, justify their existence because you might see them in the background flying and, and you certainly do in, in some of the wide shots and he thought well let's get a little you know alien version uh, that we can just dot around in the background and they kind of in the end made it a little bit more foreground than originally intended. Um, certainly you know <laughs> should, should we start to use one? Um, so yeah, there, there was, there was uh, again, there's little nods to reality without them being sort of main, the main stars. 
Um, yeah. I'm glad that wasn't in the movie. <laughs> that one always cracked me up, Jake. <laughs> You know, I, show, I, I, I very reluctantly shared that uh, with the director <laughs> on, on, you know, the very first meeting I had. It was like, that was a script moment. Well, it wasn't script. They found that, you know, that they were going to find it, but I thought I'd take it a little bit too far and see, you know, the aftermath, the, the potential for what could have gone wrong at that moment. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, so, Jake and Terrell, how much did you consider the... Um, adaptation in the environment that the animal was going to be in, um, in terms of, uh, you know, des your designs, how much did the environment that the animal was going to be in? Did you study, you know, animals here on earth and their adaptations? Or did you just kind of use your science fiction artistic license to uh, do all sorts of fun things? I would say that, um, at least for myself, and working on Phantom Menace and um, the earlier prequels, uh, that the environment, regardless of what planet it was, was very present. The environment was just as about as much of a character as the characters themselves. And the environment dictated the type of creatures that were designed for them. The creatures were designed for the environment and not the environment for the creatures. Uh, and, and so that was something that was very, I was very cognizant of. Uh, my, my own background is vertebrate pale, is vertebrate zoology, and so that was always going on in my in my brain. Okay, how we have this world? How can an organism not only survive in the world but thrive in the world? And what? How would its design enable it to do that? Just like in real life, animals and organisms we have here. That was always in my mind. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. I mean, I put my hand up and say I'm the least scientific uh, person in this group. Everyone else is far more qualified than I am. Um, but, uh, I certainly am aware, you know, I have a sort of, you know, an interest in, in, in science to a certain level and an interest in natural history. And yeah, you apply, I suppose you look at the environment and you apply what you know about terrestrial environments. Uh, you know, desert, desert things are going to sort of, sort of create certain things. Um, jungles are going to do something else based on what you know from reality and I think it's that uh, those little things that, that, that you the audience from Earth, those terrestrial hooks that make those aliens believable you know, we could come up with some crazy stuff which is like beyond well, you know it, 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 so beyond things we even comprehend, you know, crazy blobs but it, it would just be like a uh, crazy Star Trek feature, really, I suppose, and a lot more sort of science fiction. Um, and this is really science fiction, if that makes sense. It's very fun. I think there's a lot of science involved. Well, yeah, yeah you yeah, talked to Jake about um, designing for ones you knew were going to be practical, practically rendered versus uh, CGI. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, I'll just keep going. Um, yeah. Our remix was very practical. It was a very big desire from the directors to really push practical effects and shoot as much as you could in camera. Um, you know, the original trilogy had been, you know, you know puppets or, or stop motion. And we tried to sort of do that. And in some respects, a lot of the designs may have had the sort of uh, yeah, like for instance, this horse is the Orbax, which are the space horses. Even though we ended up in CG, due to time restrictions, we would have actually done them practically uh, if the shooting schedule hadn't changed. And so a lot of the design elements to begin with were orientated up to be, say, like the nostrils, were going to, yeah, where, where the, the, the horse is going to look through the eyes. So we made a lot of concessions to uh practical uh requirements so yeah the designs were were evolved around some of the practical solutions we needed yeah we didn't just and was that true <laughs> just the horse was that, <laughs> was that true for you at all on the sequels Terrell? is most of that oh uh, yes yeah. oh definitely um in fact george felt very strongly about mixing it up 
um, CG and practical effects because if it's entirely CG, you start to get into that uncanny valley feeling, but if you mix it up with practical um, effects that where you're using real light and such bouncing off objects, then that that can blend into the sense of reality. So yes, indeed, um, mixing it up with practical and and um, digital was the way to go. And and actually, the slide that you're showing now with Ketmal, um, he was a very much a um, practical effect, and uh, he was one of the creatures that was designed for the revamping of the cantina scene. And, and that, you only really see his head in the movie, but his entire body, as you can see, was also designed because you never know when you might have needed to use it. <laughs> so, indeed, absolutely. All right, so I think I'm gonna have the other scientists uh, switch on. So Terrell and Jake, if you don't mind uh, giving Frank and Angela your spots for a little bit, but do raise your hand uh, in the comments if you have something to add and we'll get you back on. Okay, so um, Angela, why don't you tell us a little bit about the extremophiles, um, both here on Earth and in the Star Wars universe? Yeah, uh, cool stuff. Uh, it was it was really great seeing all the concept art. Um, so of course, you know, looking through uh, all the movies, um, you know, as as someone who looks in, uh, for you know life in space, um, it's it's really cool seeing all the little neat adaptations um, that that Terrell and Jake have come up with. Um, first of all, so like the the Minox, uh, we've got a picture of those there. Those are really impressive, right? Um, so these guys are in the uh, Empire Strikes Back, and when they land. Um, on the asteroid, uh, which turns out to be the mouth of an uh, uh, exogorth, um, they find these Minox that are eating electricity from their ships. Um, that was actually, that's actually a thing on Earth, um, not necessarily by animals, um, but a lot of these really space-like creatures we find on Earth um, are, are mainly microbes, um, but that is actually a thing on Earth. Uh, are there, um, are there things that eat electricity on Earth? And yes, uh, bacteria. So they're they're electricity eating bacteria, um, and these bacteria have completely gone. Um, they've lost all necessity for food. They get their energy directly from the source. Um, so they have these little wire-like uh, threads, right? So there's an example of a Geobacter bacteria. It's got these little uh, like wire-like threads, uh, and they take. Uh, uh, electrons from the environment. Um, so for example, wherever you find these geobacters, sometimes they're in mud, sometimes they're in the deep sea. If you stick an electrode, uh, an electric current uh, with an electrode into that area, these bacteria will colonize that electrode because they are getting their uh, nutrients straight from, or they're getting their energy straight from this electrode. Um, so that's really cool. So these Minox, um, going back, they have, uh, even in their mouths, they're kind of thread-like, um, and then they go to ships and they steal the electricity from the ships, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, you know, it's these electric bacteria were discovered in 1988. When was Empire Strikes Back? Uh, that would have been 80. 80? Ah, so yeah. well ahead of its time, you know. Uh, very, very cool stuff, um, you know, with, with you know, crazy organisms. Um, you know, again, Star Wars well ahead of its time. We discover these things later and we're like, oh, wow, how cool, you know. Um, what else? Yeah, so the the exogorth itself, right? So lives in an asteroid, um, lives inside rock, right? Um, so again, you know, as scientists, we know that there are um, things that, you know, bacteria that live inside rock to guard themselves from solar radiation or dehydration, right? They can keep the moisture in, they can guard themselves from uh, solar radiation, radiation in general. Um, so that's already really cool. Um, what else? So both these things were supposed to be silica-based life forms. Um, that's another cool thing in astrobiology. There's, um, you know, when you're hypothesizing other forms of life, right? So we are all carbon-based life forms on Earth. Everybody is, their primary uh, primary composition is carbon, right? Um, but there's, um, you know, when you're hypothesizing other life on Earth, you can think of silica-based, uh, silicon-based life forms. Um, we, we are all carbon-based on Earth. However, there are some organisms that incorporate uh, silicon into their uh, lifestyle, such as these diatoms Melissa has on these screens. So these organisms incorporate um, 
silica into their shells. So they have a glass like protector um, over their bodies, which is really cool. So diatoms are these little phytoplankton. Um, they can also live in ice. Um, so one of my favorite creatures I mentioned at the beginning is a tauntaun. Um, and I really appreciate, you know, that again, the artists thought about, you know, in Terrell's book, um, it talks about all about how the tauntaun survive off of uh, primary producers like ice algae. Um, and again, we find algae living in ice. And that was recently, I mean, that was discovered fairly recently, you know, like what is all this brown goop in the ice in Antarctica? Um, turns out they're live algae, right? Living in the ice, um, which is really cool, which sustain ecosystems. Um, so it's really cool that, again, Terrell's mentioned that in her book, you know, kind of uh, when you look at a whole world, um, not just the animal, but then, you know, a little bit about the ecosystem or what it lives off of. And it's cool to, you know, see on Roth, the ice planet, um, that they've mentioned these plants and algae that live in the ice, because that, that is a thing on Earth as well. Um, a lot of cool extremophiles living in places that we, you know, approach the near limits of life itself, which is really cool stuff. Yeah, as you can see, Angela was a great expert uh, for me to talk to about the um, Star Wars Insider article, where we also talked about the pergils uh, from Star Wars Rebels, and also uh, that large uh, octopus-like uh, thing out in space in Solo. So um, all these animals that live out in the vacuum of space. Um, yeah, great. someone was just mentioning the purgles in the chat. I thought that was cool. The, the whales that float through space. Is that it? Right, yeah. Part whale, part uh, part um, squid or something. So Yeah, um, cool. Uh, Frank, I'll have you, if you want to talk about the reptile and amphibian analogs in Star Wars. Sure. You want to start with the warts? Yeah. I'll have that thing. All right. So... The warts um, in Terrell's book that she wrote on the wildlife of Star Wars, which is a great um, field book that she was co-author on, it describes them as being amphibious and, um, you know, just kind of having explosive breeding. So whenever there's a rainfall event on Tatooine, it's probably a short-lived kind of thing. Um, so they actually will go out and lay their eggs and reproduce, and their little tadpoles um, have to grow in. Uh, develop very, very quickly. And that's really similar to a real life frog that lives in the uh, American uh, Southwest, which is the spadefoot frog here. And if you look at this species, it's so wild looking, right? It looks like it could be something from one of the Star Wars movies. Look at those eyes and the little <laughs> orange spots. Um, and they have a lot of the same characterizations and features that the, the warts have. Um, they have uh, these events where when it rains in the winter time here, it's only like a short period of rain and they actually live underground for most of their life and they're buried underground and they are surrounded by this sack. So they have a mucus sack that covers their whole body to protect them from drying out, from desiccating in the dry time. So 10 months out of the year, they're just underground waiting for the rain to fall. And when they feel the rainfall, they can actually burrow up above the ground come up and find these temporary pools and reproduce really quickly. So they're very similar to the, uh, the biology and natural history of the warts, which have a very similar um, life history. And they're also endangered, right? So a lot of these animals that are inspiring, um, you know, artists like Terrell and Jake to kind of come up with um, these sketches on earth are, are sometimes endangered. So it's another kind of link and important message for us to try to protect the, the real life wildlife as well. Um, and then next would be uh, another cool amphibian. So that's kind of my background is studying endangered amphibians. So whenever I see amphibians in the, the Star Wars universe, it gets me really excited. And this is none other than um, the child, otherwise known as Baby Yoda, consuming or trying to consume a frog. And if you remember from the season one of The Mandalorian, he consumed um, two frogs. The first frog he actually swallowed and, and ate it. And that that frog was like a brownish color. And if you look at this frog, you see some kind of bright colors on the legs, right? So what do you think that might be signaling if the, a frog or any other um, organism might have some bright colors? So it's probably a signal that it's poisonous. And that's what real world frogs on earth here, these are the Adelopis genus of frogs found in um, Panama, so Central America and South America. They're really critically endangered. Look how amazing and beautiful these colors are. So they're active during the day. They'll be out in the middle of a stream. 
where there's a, a high risk of um, encountering predators, but because they have these bright colors, um, it protects them against predation. And you look at these, like they look like they really did inspire the artist that made the, um, the color scheme on that frog that Baby Yoda was swallowing. And if you go back to that, he actually spit it up and you know the little kids were kind of looking at him, like telling him not to swallow it. But I really think that Baby Yoda spit it up because it tasted bad. So it was probably poisonous and it probably had some nasty secretions on its skin. And so I wouldn't have eaten it either. Um, he probably had a good tasting frog the first time. The second time he's like, no, this does not taste right. So he spit it up. So that, that poisonous uh, signal is true to that color scheme. Um, so it protected the frog from, from dying and it moved to see another day. So it's pretty. <laughs> Great. Um, and then Tracy, we know in the Star Wars universe that there are a whole lot of planets with one ecosystem, like you mentioned, uh, forest moons and ice planets. What, how would that lead to uh, adaptations on those planets? Uh, even, even planets that have like a homogenous, homogenous ecosystem would have um, changes to their, its environmental conditions over time. And that's really kind of what drives evolution is uh, uh, changes that are driven by geologic events or uh, um, changing weather patterns, things like that. So they that would that would constantly be um, changing. You know, habitats. Some habitats would would expand. Some would be lost. New new niches was open. Um, species would either adapt to those or die out. Um, and, but what, given my background in, in work, spending so many years working in damaged ecosystems, my first thought is that how many of these planets are actually in their pristine state, um, and how many have had some sort of in, outside influences from all the interstellar travel, um, and what species have been introduced, um, that have changed the population dynamics of the creatures that, that were native there. Um, and I, that's, that's a really fascinating aspect to me because, uh, you know, I've dealt with, with invasive species of plants in my career and, and, uh, they really can thoroughly transform, uh, an ecosystem, um, to the detriment of everything that was, that was originally there. Um, so they can be, that can be a driver of evolution too. Um, all the influences of, of off-world, um, introductions, um, and then, you know, of course, the development that, that inevitably happens when, when uh, uh, off-worlders come and start exploiting the resources and so forth. Um, some, hab some habitats are, are damaged, um, you know, pollution changes, changes the, the atmosphere. Um, so all those are drivers of evolution as well. And uh, it's really fascinating to me that because that, I in browsing through uh, Terrell's book, um, so many of the creatures, and we see this in the, you know, in the films too, so many of the creatures have adaptations that, that make them, even if they're, even if they're lower on the food chain, you know, they're not necessarily predators. They had to have adaptations that, that defensive adaptations that make them look really fierce. And that kind of leads me to think that, that th life is really a struggle for all of these these creatures on these worlds that they've had to ad adapt tusks and uh, you know claws and and all sorts of things that that uh, um, we don't really normally see on like herbivores here on, in you know on Earth. Yeah. Um, so I find that really fascinating too to think yeah. about um, what what they've what those life is like um, and the struggle for survival on these planets. Yeah, Carol, do you want to hop in? And I know in your book, there's some mention of the invasive species. Minox is one we've already talked about, grabbing onto ships mm -hmm. um, and, and going from planet to planet. That's something that I work in oceanography, and that's something we have to be uh, concerned with in terms of ballast water moving animals from place to place and them taking over. So um, uh, Tracy, you can stay on if you want. I've got more questions for you. Well, as far as invasive species goes, I, you know, in, in the world of Star Wars, everybody is always traveling. There are spaceships that can go everywhere. And so, of course, the people are going to bring pets with them, 
They're going to bring livestock. They're going to bring un, unintended, um, uh, what, what do I say, um, animal species that sneak on, you know, how rats mm -hmm. and such sneak on or whatever by, by design or, or accident or um, some 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 species are brought intentionally, some accidentally. And so you see all this seeding of these planets. Um, for example, you know, the rancors aren't native to Tatooine. They come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, but there are, you know, people associate them with Tatooine because of that one particular poor lonely rancor that just happens to be, you know, a slave to Jabba. Uh, and then, of course, there's some funny things like in um, Cor you know, Corcon um, where you get Dianagas in the sewer system and they, oh, hello, when is time you want to use? That was one of the most fascinating chapters of that book was the Coruscant <laughs> wildlife. Yeah. So you have a right. lot of, yeah. in those urban areas, you have a lot of imports, you know, and maybe species that were taken to zoos. I mean, I would assume that we have zoos here. And there's always escapees and, and such. Um, so I think, I think that's fascinating. And, and yeah, there you go. Um, in, in Coruscant, you have all kinds of animals. You have wampas in Coruscant, you have the, the poles. You've got um, things that are in hiding in the alleys that will eat you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angela, if you don't mind trading out with Jake, I'd love to hear his thoughts on porg infestation. Did we lose uh, now that? Oh. oh. Can you hear me? Uh oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> She's back. Drop out. There she You're is. Back. Yeah. Come here. Okay. You guys can hear me? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say if Angela or if Jake, you want to grab that spot, I'm interested to hear about uh, what you think of Chewbacca taking porgs off of Akku. Well, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and Tracy, if you want to pop in here, but I think it's bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm picturing pork infestations uh -huh. everywhere. There you go. Everything had um, uh, Tribbles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a little pork infestation. I mean, yeah, Ch Chewie took one, adopted one. I think you saw one, another one making a little nest uh, in the bulwark or, you know, the, the, the I guess, I don't know if, if, if she is, I've always assumed he's male. Yeah, there's, there's a, I guess there's a male and female plus a little brood of eggs waiting to hatch. Now spread across the galaxy, uh, or at least the start, the, you know, the begun, <laughs> unleashed. Yeah. Well, and I know you said Although that never... the steel tech seal pecking bird is clearly, you know, adapted to a different environment probably than, than originally. So that's something that you considered in some of your designs for the inhabited planet. Birds or yeah. other things. Well, if there were other uh, ones, yeah. but I remember you mentioned that one. Yeah, I did. What, can you remember the other one I said? There was a, uh, Think about the Dianaga, in, you know, in the chapter, thinking that that must, that was just an assumption. I've always assumed that that must have got some, you know, that's a, it always just looks a bit sort of, you know, metal, like metal tech sort of stuff. So I've always assumed it somehow lived off some kind of minerals leaching off, you know, rust and. Well, I don't know, unless somebody else, has, maybe Carol's already explained it. I've explained <laughs> the face of the giant face to me until that was uh, explained. Um, I don't know, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't remember when anything else had that kind specifically apart from the metal packing bird. Um, yeah. Although we did do other things like the, the lugger beast, in, which had been completely and it would be made to adapt in another way, other than that count, poor thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in your, in your feeling, Tracy, is Dagobah like one untouched planet? I know we don't see most much of it, but it, it seems very wild to me. Yeah, it does. It seems like, like that might be 
um, one of the, you know, one of the few remaining sort of pristine, undisturbed planets there, which kind of leads you to, to leads me to think why. Um, what is it about? Uh, is it the is it the atmosphere that's so hard to fly through um, that disables ships? Um, you know what what it is about that um, planet because it's obviously rich in resources, but yet it's been left alone um, uh, to uh, kind of look pretty much like a natural ecosystem. Um, another one that comes to mind is, uh, and I don't know that I can't remember the name of it, but the the planet that um, Yoda visits um, in the uh, uh, Lost Missions of the Clone Wars, where the three he encounters the three Force priestesses. Um, that's another one that looks um, fairly undisturbed, and and that one's obviously because it's the, that planet is sort of hidden. I think he had you know had to have special knowledge to get to that place. So, yeah, it makes one wonder how many how many worlds you know would be that way in such a gal in a galaxy where where you know space travel has been um, the case for you know perhaps millennia. I mean, you, the Jedi talk about going back a thousand generations, so I'm assuming they had space travel all that time um, to be the guardians of peace and justice throughout the galaxy. So there's been there's been some influences on all these planets um, for quite some time. Yeah, Jake, if you don't mind switching out with Frank, I know he had some thoughts about Dagobah. Thanks everyone for. Yeah, it seems like Dagobah has some great biodiversity, as Tracy was talking about, you know, how it looks really pristine. There's so many different species that we see there. Um, so it's kind of cool to see, you know, so many different varieties of creatures. And a lot of them actually reflect real world creatures. So if you look at the, the scenes in The Empire Strikes Back when it's in Yoda's hut, if you look at that photo there, that scene from um, Luke first getting into Yoda's hut, he's kind of impatient and angry and he sees this snake there and he kind of just picks it up and tosses it aside and if you recognize that snake it's actually a california king snake so it's a species of snake that's native in the in, you know in california here um so it's kind of cool to see that overlap and there's a lot of other species like um, monitor lizards and other real life animals that were roaming around on the set and it just kind of adds a level of kind of biodiversity and realism to that scene, which is so, so cool. And a fun little tidbit is that when Luke was actually working um, on the set, he got bit when uh, Mark Hamill was looking, he got bit by a snake um, at one point and that obviously didn't make it into the movie, but it's a cool little, little thing you can look up on YouTube, Luke Skywalker bit by snake and yeah. And looks like Yoda or um, R2-D2 is in the back scanning the biodiversity, making sure that Luke's safe or something, so. <laughs> right, worrying outside the window. Mm -hmm. um, Tara, I'm curious, oh, Tracy, you have something to share? Yeah, I just, this, this, uh, this, this so is, I, this is my favorite page, two pages in the book, actually, because um, this is the, shows the, the, the varying layers of life in Dagama, Dagaba from ground level going up into the canopy and this this mirrors so well what we see in our own uh, rainforest, both tropical and temperate. It's just, it's really cool. I, I really like that tarot. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Animals are so fascinating. Very hard. I think that goes back to what Tara was saying about the niches, right? You When you have a vertebrate yes. biology background and you yeah. talk about how you made all these niches. So that's such a cool concept. <laughs> Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was a fun one to do. Someone in the chat mentioned Naboo as well. Uh, and I'm curious, since that's my favorite probably planet, uh, since I'm into marine science, I'm curious, Carol, mm -hmm. about your, um, your, you know, experience getting to getting to flesh that out. Well, Naboo, though, as you take that planet as a whole, is just so, um, so, biologically lush, it's so rich. Um, anywhere from the swamp, um, the swamp creatures to the plains, the beautiful green plains to obviously the deep um, the atmosphere depths of the going through the core of the planet. So that was just 
like this whole like Noah's Ark full of delight to to, to do. And I, I think part of it is that I'm, I'm half Floridian in the part of Florida where my roots are are the springs in the Panhandle. And so there's a lot of cool swamps and cool creatures and alligator snapping turtles and alligators and big huge roaches. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and then I live, presently I live in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. We have this, it's like New Zealand of North America, this lush green, and then going to the ocean, beautiful sheer cliffs. And we have a trio of live volcanoes and it's you know, beautiful. Um, so all of that, all of, all of those ecosystems I kind of put into Naboo and there's that fascination with uh, bioluminescent fish and such that live in the depths of the ocean. Um, and so it was a place where I could really explore extremes um, and beauty at the same time. So often we think of space, space creatures or science fiction creatures as being like full of hard surfaces or scoots and horns and such. But this was a chance to really create some animals that were rather, while they were odd, they were exotically you know, beautiful too. And so that was, that was fun. Um, uh, as far as the um, depths of the, the core um, ocean, I would guess you'd say the inner ocean, uh, that was fun in that these, the three, the three big um, predators uh, were very diverse. Um, the, the first one, um, was a little chimera because I think I mentioned in an earlier meeting that it was kind of an angler crustacean combo, but it, it was fun. You know, it was, it was a fun, yeah, the OPC killer. And that was actually originally a Doug Chang design. And then I worked on the anatomy and such. And then the polo crawfish was like, you know, kind of moray eel, black swallower and crocodile. And uh, then the aquasando monster was actually more of a, I would say a repto but mammal, basically. And that had a lot of mammalian anatomy in it. It did have gills, but the animal actually also has lungs. So it's this very adaptable animal that can go all the way from the depths to the surface of the swamp because it eats anything. And that was actually the animal that inspired, the earth animal that inspired the aquasanda monster is a tiger. That's the animal that I was, always had in mind was a tiger, especially, Particularly the tiger from Apocalypse Now. That was the, the one. Right. Like, what is That's that? Cool. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Thanks for having that book uh, up, Tracy. Yeah, I know yeah and, not, I, and I love she, 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 she included great. little skin parasites on the. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we basically nice. this time it was create a creature that could eat Godzilla for lunch. And so <laughs> <laughs> okay. Frank, if you don't mind switching on with Jake, I was going to ask him about his marine creatures too. So I know in mm -hmm. Acto there was some fish, uh, and I was going to ask him about that if he's still around. Um, yeah, there we go. Let's see if he's able to join us. Jake, I remember you saying that fish are basically aliens to you anyway. So how did that uh, influence you designing? Yeah. Well, they, they're, they're the, they're the marine animals, fish are just the hardest alien. You know, I think Ryan wanted some fish for Luke to catch and carry, and I think the, the caretakers were going to cut them up. We were going to have a fish market at one point in Solo. I don't think we ever made it, but again, we made lots of fish. And in both of those cases, when the directors have said, oh, we want some cool alien fish, it's impossible. It's just so hard because... Fish are just the most old marine creatures, not necessarily fish specifically, but just the thing, you know, every, quite regularly I'm watching the news and they'll say, oh, we've been down the Mariana Trench or some, you know, very deep exploration, we found this new thing. It's like mind-blowingly bizarre, alien. Yeah, so it's very, very, I found it very hard to come up with something that is, you know, not, doesn't just look like a crazy fish. From a really, it's um, yeah. There are some. These are. I mean, again, these the uh, these were early. Uh, uh, what was it the, the sea cow ideas, which were a bit easier, I have to say. But fish, 
the Fiji game fish, is, I find it very hard. So well done, Terrell, for her take and her what she managed to do to the Phantom Menace because uh, I struggled. But thank you. <laughs> Well, Amanda had a question in the chat that goes into one I was going to ask anyway in terms of domestication. So in um, Empire, we've got the Tauntauns uh, on Hoth that are domesticated. Um, there's also all sorts of other beasts of burden, the Dubaks, the Banthas. Um, so I'm curious for Terrell and Jake how it was different um, designing the creatures that the, the main characters were going to sort of utilize versus just the sort of in the background wildlife. Okay, so um, I'm thinking of animals like um, the what the Gungans are, are riding, and also like the EOPs and the like. Um, right, those? exactly. Yeah. Well, um, for example, the EOPs would be sort of camel analogs. They were basically camel analogs, and you know, it's funny. I'm having a brain freeze right now. I mean, I've got <laughs> all these characters, but um, and sometimes the names start to meld after a while. The animals mm -hmm. that the Gungans are riding, um, oh, there's um, Fambas, and then there's, ah, oh, that's the, the, the two-legged ones. Um, those are ostrich and dinosaur analogs. And basically, it, could this animal carry someone, you know, a humanoid rider um, could, or other types of loads easily? And how similar is that to what animals are already used um, here on Earth? You know, the camels or horses or yaks or elephants. And so those are things that I kept in mind that way. Yeah, Jake, you have a, a bunch. I'm showing here some of your concept art from Solo, I believe. Was well, it's going to be a, a bigger mind sequence and a possibility of, you know, beast to sort of partly uh, aid them in mining uh, and again it's a sort of mishmash of, of uh, tech technology and a, and a giant beast again I said already that you know a lot of our stuff is is practically driven what the leather beast is driven by you know the war horse puppeteering principle uh, the big beast, which is just one above you, uh, and the other beast in that slideshow, which you saw on on uh, that one. Again, that's warhorse technology taken to the next level, uh, where we had a five puppeteers uh, creating it. I've totally forgotten the thread of this question, so I'm now talking about <laughs> practical effects and not biology. Um, domestication. Yeah, I mean, again, you just try and find things that you recognize. You know, this, we did various different versions of the big beast when we settled on something that was pig-like. These guys showed up in, in Pisana in, in, in the last the Rise of Skywalker. Oh no, they were, they were originally, this was going to be in Pisana. It ended up, we used it in Tatooine. It was just uh, one of those things. But again, it was finding something camel-like. You know, we wanted to they find something that was, you'd think, oh, it's a bit like a camel, it's a bit like a giraffe. You sort of latch onto it. Um, you knew that they, they were practically able to do the things that camels and giraffes, as beasts, well, camels could do as beasts of burden. But then you just throw in, you know, oh, I want to get, this is just me going off. I'll give it some pincers like an ant. Uh, and then maybe it has to sort of eat, I don't know, it's got to, it doesn't have a, a mouth and teeth, it has much more of a, uh, it kind of grinds it up to be pincers just because it looks cool, really. I mean, I don't really get into it. I just try to find something that looks relatable uh, to something you recognize and, and, and combining it with something else. Um, but as I say, the other sort of beasts of burden, like the horses, were really based, you know, it's like the banter in, in the original uh, EOT in Star Wars with an elephant. And I think everyone would love being able to use practical solutions where possible. So, you know, they had to be like horses. But again, these were horse. These were horses. They, we we dressed these up. They've got giant. You know, the only reason they've got these big bug eyes. These are the Orbacks. Are they Orbacks? Oh, from Solo. Uh, 
they've got these big uh, compound eyes simply because the horses need big sort of orifices to see through comfortably without getting spooked. So we gave them, to give them a bigger hole to look through. Those are just back painted pieces of plastic. They can see perfectly clearly through them and have no obstruction. But it was kind of, hey, this is, you know, cool. We've, we've given a sort of vaguely mammalian uh, beast uh, compound eyes, which I don't know, I've, I've probably got against an entire terrestrial biological rule or something, <laughs> broken every rule. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> you can look quite no, cool. I, I've got, I own two horses. I have, own a dressage prospect and then I have my schoolmaster horse who's very forgiving for me and and what you're saying makes makes a lot of sense you know and have one horse and that and working she's very green so she's in the in the yeah. fundamentals of her training and she's got a fly mask as, as well and then i've got my schoolmaster i just i call him my schoolmaster because he's very forgiving right. <laughs> um but what you're saying is very true and uh it's interesting to see how much a horse will tolerate as far as costuming and putting accents yeah. on them i mean the very fact that they allow bridles and saddles and all no, sorts they, of things like you know, that in history they've worn you know armor and all sorts you know dress you know, the whole armor and, and livery and everything like that so they're quite they're quite amenable but there's things like Indeed, they hate yes. that. they need their ears to be sort of quite mobile they need a nice space around their eyes they need a certain mm -hmm. amount of so you have to make these concessions so i've learned about oh, horses yeah. <laughs> i learned yeah. i now know more about horses cool. They're incredible animals, that's for sure. Well, we're going to start wrapping up. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to ask all of my panelists if there are, and also everyone watching, com feel free to comment, um, what your what animal in the Star Wars universe you most want to know more about. Um, and so for me, that is the Rancor. Um, I know that Terrell's book, I also read the Jabba's Palace book, when I was younger um, and got really fascinated by the idea that the Rancor was essentially a pet. Um, and you see that a little bit in Return of the Jedi with the keeper, you know, crying when it's killed. Um, and that made me think about pets in the Star Wars universe. And if Jake is still there, maybe he can talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll just go through the panelists real quick of, of what animal, even those of you who design them, what, what animals you want to know more about just uh, having not seen enough screen time. Uh, So, Jake, I know you put a couple of pets in the casino scene. Um, I did. Oh, the pets. Oh, God, yeah. There aren't enough pets, I don't think. Uh, we, I, I put in a, a sort of uh, a strange dog. I think you see it very, very briefly, um, which is, I, I had it sort of with this sort of inflatable kind of um, abdomen where it would, you know, my idea was that somehow it had some gas. This is it. And it sort of fills its, its abdomen up with some lighter than air gas. I don't know how. Um, I sort of thought, oh, maybe it could live in a sort of gas giant, even though that doesn't really make sense. But it lived in the air. It floats around. It, it would have, given the fact that it had four legs, I made the rear legs sort of vestigial, like they sort of evolved away, which kind of suggests that at one point there was some land for it to walk on. So the gas giant thing was mm, maybe not. But yeah, it, it just paddles its way through the atmosphere um, and it's now become this sort of little pet dog to this lady, uh, became somebody else's, this lady, uh, she lost out. And then there was another dog we had, which I didn't design, which is on the next slide down, which was, you could just see there being held by the uh, creature in the background. Neither of these are my designs, but they were both designed by Luke Fisher, one of my colleagues. And this little guy is, kind of loosely based a uh, little homage to Gary Fisher, who is Carrie Fisher's, or was Carrie Fisher's pet dog. And it's this little, you know, sort of, uh, I think it's French Bulldog or, or uh, something similar. So it has some of those characteristics. Um, yeah, there aren't quite enough. I think, as far as I know, there aren't many other pets. Maybe, I don't know, if Salacious Crumb warrants being a pet to Jabber or whether he's just some sort of little creep. Um, you know, he is sentient, so maybe he's not a pet. Yeah, yeah. So do you have a favorite uh, or an animal that you would want to know more about, Jake, uh, that you want to drill down with some of these scientists about? 
Uh, I, well, in a way, I suppose, I'm not sure if you've already answered this because they've always been intrigued by the space slug, and I, the Exegoth or something, is it? And yeah, I know that Carol yeah. has sort of you know, answered a lot of those questions in the book. Uh, it is still, I mean, it's got teeth. Has it not got teeth that you see as it yeah. closes? What, what, why? <laughs> That's what I want to, you know, it's got teeth. It must eat something uh, fleshy. Um, I thought I'm kind of curious to know what it's teeth, or are they just vestigial teeth, perhaps? I don't know. Right. Or maybe it eats my heart. All right. Well, you'll have to read my Star Wars Insider article coming coming soon. So, uh, how about you, Carol? <laughs> well, um, I'm always intrigued by some of the 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 creatures on the side, um, the ones just just as in nature. I'm I'm we all, all see the you know, lions and tigers, and they get a lot of attention. But I'm personally more fascinated in fossas and civets and genets and those type of predators that, that we don't hear talked about too much. In the world of Star Wars, um, there is a particular bird called the Peco Peco, and you see him fly by very, very quickly, but he fulfills the same role as say a hornbill or you know blue hyacinth macaw would in, in our earth. So I'd like to know more about him. And then there is a creature that didn't make it to the films, but did make it, I believe, after <coughs> to the Clone Wars and other um, properties, and that was the Zalakas. The, the, the Zalakas live in the swamp, and they are actually terrestrial relatives of the Sado Aqua monster. They're like kind of vicious dragon horses, and I'd like to know, you know, I would like to see more, like more exploration right. in those particular animals. Okay. So, um, and Terrell and Jake, if you don't mind swapping out for Frank and Angela so they can give their last uh, minute. Tracy, uh, what, what about you? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued by the life history of the Zillow Beast. We just got like a, I think a three episode introduction to this giant uh, monster um, when, uh, when it was released from hibernation by the detonation of a super weapon. And uh, we're kind of led to believe that, that, that this is the last in, of these individuals. Um, but I'm, you know, considering how it was found, I'm always wondering, you know, are there still more buried under the surface? And then it's like, what happened on that planet to make them, you know, make it, even if there's just that one, make him go into that state of hibernation? Like it was a planetary catastrophe or just you know too much too much predation and they went into hiding or but uh but yeah and it's it's seeming ability to um uh deflect pretty much any type of weapon including lightsabers and uh and and does it really have an affinity for the dark side to for the force and especially the dark side of the force because once it encounters palpatine it pretty much focuses on him the rest of the time that it's rampaging around Coruscant, I mean, you see, you see there, it's got a hold of his shuttle. Um, so I'm wondering if it has a, a you know, an innate uh, affinity for uh, the dark side of the Force, and it's drawn to it in an aggressive way. Yeah. How about you, Angela? Uh, all the space creatures, of course, uh, but also uh, I, my one of my favorites, the Sarlacc. Um, it's it's just really neat. It's also got some. Like you see on an anglerfish, this parasitic male, um, and then uh, and then you know living over thousands and thousands of years with that really slow digestion. Um, like to find out more about those chemical properties of that acid. Really neat stuff. Uh, but yeah, the sarlacc was kind of one of my favorites. Sorry, Frank, I didn't give you much time, but let's hear from you. Real quick, I want to learn more about the blurgs and whether or not they give good hugs with those four limbs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I want to thank all my panelists. Uh, again, Force Fest is raising money for Make-A-Wish, so you can donate via the link in the chat, or if you're on Get Vocal, there's that um, blue diamond, and Get Vocal will match 33%. Um, thank you so much to my scientists and to my artists. I'm going to throw up a slide real quick for a couple of seconds, maybe? No? Um, uh, just with all of our information on it, if you want to find us on social media, hopefully that will stay up for at least a couple of seconds. <laughs> um, and then you can get in touch with us. Do you have other?
in touch with us uh, scientists and art questions. Um, and definitely check out uh, Terrell and Jake's uh, Instagram feeds. They've got so much of their great concept art. So um, if they want to hop on and say bye, that's great. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I hope to hear more from you and to get to write more about this. So Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad it ended up being virtual and thanks for Force Fest uh, for putting this together so we could still have a Star Wars celebration this weekend and making it possible for Terrell and Jake to join us from um, outside, uh, outside of Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much Thank for you. your time. Uh, and Jake mm -hmm. and Terrell, thank you so much for your contributions to the Star Wars universe. It is obviously all of our favorites here in this panel. So. It's our pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>